morning, everybody. Welcome to Fetal Care Chat today. My name is Lonnie Summers. I'm the uh, director and founder of the Fetal Health Foundation. And today we are joined by a wonderful panel from Cincinnati Children's Fetal Care Center. We're going to be talking about a very important topic today, and that is bladder outlet obstruction in bilateral renal anomalies, which is so important. Sometimes we've known as lower urinary tract obstruction and a whole host of other names that come into play with this. And this is gonna be a very, very important uh, fetal care chat today and educational seminar. Uh, we are joined by Dr. David McKinney, maternal fetal medicine specialist. We're also uh, joined by Beth Rameski, Dr. Beth Rameski, uh, pediatric surgeon and uh, Steph and Dr. Stephanie Riddle, uh, neonatal director and Mel Minges, our fetal care center nurse, who is going to uh, kick things off with us and introduce a very special guest that we have today. Uh, Mel, it's wonderful to have you here too, because you're gonna talk a little bit about your responsibility before we introduce our special guest. Um, the nurse coordinator, I like to say, is the glue that holds everything together and you become kind of that surrogate parent that so many of us need in time of crisis. So uh, Mel, we'll turn everything over to you, but welcome. Thank you, thank you so much, Lonnie. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so just to talk a little bit about um, what I do as a nurse coordinator, um, a lot of the times I um, get the question, what is a nurse coordinator and what do they do in fetal care? So um, for me, a nurse coordinator in fetal care is a nurse that helps to coordinate the care of and be an advocate for a pregnant woman and her fetus during a high risk complicated pregnancy. At our center, we have five nurse coordinators who come from varying backgrounds, such as labor and delivery, like myself, and um, NICU nursing backgrounds um, They've prior to working at fetal care. So having experience prior to entering this field is necessary as being a nurse in fetal care involves caring not just for one patient, but for two, meaning mom and baby. So the five nurse coordinators at our center have the ability to care for any fetal diagnosis, but we all have our strong suits or diagnoses that we have an interest in and have become experts on. For instance, I have a strong interest in renal fetal anomalies and bladder outlet obstruction, and I am the nurse most, that will mo most often assume care of these patients at the time of their referral. This allows the patient to interact and be cared for by a nurse in the field who has an extensive amount of knowledge regarding a specific diagnosis. Not many people can say that they enjoy their work or their job, but that is something I can honestly say. I love my job. My job allows me the opportunity to help patients during one of the most difficult times in their life. The nurse coordinator in fetal care um, he has the opportunity to work very closely with our patients for an extended period of time, which results in more than the average nurse-patient relationship and oftentimes results in a friendship or a bond. Um, we get to know our patient's family, their children, uh, what type of work they do, what their hopes and goals for the pregnancy are, and what their fears may be. We are able to walk alongside our patients during their pregnancy journey. I still communicate with several of my patients that delivered years ago, and they keep me updated on their family and how their child is progressing. And it is very rewarding for me as a nurse to have this opportunity to have this type of relationship with my patients. So today, I have the opportunity and honor of introducing to you one of our former fetal care patients that I had the pleasure of working with. Daisy Wilkie was a self-referral to our center on May 31st, 2018 at 20 weeks and four days gestation for suspected bladder outlet obstruction. She was seeking a second opinion for a bladder shunt. I remember my first conversation with Daisy and how determined she was as a mother to find help for her unborn child. We saw Daisy uh, for a two-day evaluation on June 19th and 20th. Prior to her evaluation with us, she had four bladder taps with an amnioinfusion with each tap. After review of imaging performed at our center, the multidisciplinary team spoke to Daisy about the possible option of serial amnioinfusions in the pregnancy by direct approach in an attempt to help her baby's lungs develop inside the womb. Daisy ended up having 11 amnioinfusions by direct approach in Cincinnati with Dr. Hobley and delivered baby um, John Jr., AKA JJ, in Texas on October 1st, 2018. We are very excited to have Daisy here with us today to talk about her pregnancy journey, what happened to JJ after birth, and how he is doing today.
Well, thank you so much for, for having me. I, I'm just, I mean, so indebted to the team at Cincinnati Children that, you know, I will do anything that you guys ask. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I just want to share my story. Like we found out at 20 weeks when we went, went, went for the 20 week scan that, you know, my baby at that time had a bladder obstruction because his bladder was huge and, and just unusually huge. And then, you know, there was no amniotic fluid around it. And this had been, you know, like a wanted pregnancy. We had gone through a lot of series of IVF just to be able to get to that pregnancy. So that was um, a very devastating diagnosis. Even to this day, I remember how I felt at that moment. I remember vividly everything that happened. So it was something that was, you know, very uncommon, but there was one doctor in, in Austin that knew something about that. So they immediately referred us to that doctor and they saw us the same day. And, you know, they wrote referrals. We went to uh, Texas Children, which is one of the bigger hospitals here in Texas to see if um, they could do the shunt and, and intervene, but, you know, it was too late. Uh, and there was just like not a lot of information. It just seems like a condition that's very, very rare. So I went on Facebook and I found like a Facebook group of like a few women that had, you know, also experienced uh, that same condition. And so they helped me find um, a doctor that was in, in Georgia that did a couple of bladder taps where they, you know, drain the bladder so that they will help them the kidney don't keep getting damaged. And, and then we also found Cincinnati children and we did the evaluation for, with Cincinnati children and they expected us as patient. And I partially like moved to Cincinnati. Sometimes I would come back home over the weekend, but sometimes I would just stay there. And um, the entire time that I was in Cincinnati, I would go in and I would get an amino infusion. So they would take like this needle and like salt water to mimic amniotic fluid. And initially they would do it once a week, then it was two times a week, then it was three times a week, just like as the baby was, was growing he was just, uh, you know, taking in a lot of the amniotic fluid, I guess. And they were doing that just so that they could help the lungs grow because they, you know, they said if the lungs are not developed and the baby is not, is born, then there's like a hundred percent chance that he's not going to be able to survive. So it was, it was hard to be away from home. It was hard to be you know, getting all those infusions because they are not, you know, they are not comfortable. It was also hard to going, to be going through a pregnancy where like, even like in the best case scenario, you're looking at like, a, you know, maybe 40% chance that the child is going to survive. Uh, and then, you know, while I was, I was uh, there in Cincinnati, you know, there were some hospitalizations that happened because of complications, but they, you know, monitored the, the pregnancy carefully. I was really well taken care of. I had a very, very good support system. And uh, we had made plans that we were going to give birth in Cincinnati so we can um, get taken care of at the NICU that they have over there because it's like one of the best NICUs in the country. But um, at 32 weeks, um, you know, they did an MRI and, you know, you know, things did not quite progress like what we're hoping. And there was also, you know, a new finding. And like, you know, this whole time I had held on to hope and I, I just, I knew there was a chance that, you know, he was going to survive. But at that point, you know, when they f did that new finding, like even in my heart of hearts, I, I just, I felt like it was over. He wasn't going to be able to, to survive even when he was born. So we moved here to, we moved back home to Texas because if he passed, I wanted to be, you know, close to home in a place that's familiar to me. And so then we moved here to back, back home to Texas and I was immediately admitted in the hospital so that because they would monitor the baby throughout that day. And then at 38 weeks, they did a C-section. And um, so he actually, um, like they didn't know if he was gonna survive um, 
more than a day, more than two days, but I mean, he survived for a day, he survived for two days. Um, he survived, like, you know, so after about uh, three or four days, then, you know, they put in a dialysis catheter so that they could do dialysis. And, um, but the dialysis was not successful. So at about when he was 13 days old, they talked to the NICU at Cincinnati Children and he was transferred to Cincinnati because um, Cincinnati is the only one that could do hemodialysis on a baby that is that small. So we took this scary flight to, to, to Cincinnati. It was very touch and go. Didn't know if he was gonna make it alive, but he did. And so he stayed in the NICU in Cincinnati for about five months until they put him in a place where he could go on a dialysis cycler, which is the kind of dialysis that you can take home with. So at that time when he was ready to have dialysis at home, then you know they transferred us back here to the hospital in, in Texas and worked with our doctors in Texas for, to reach a point where we could get discharged. You know, and then we were discharged and we've been doing home dialysis for about two and a half, you know, years, two, two and a half years of his life at home. And it, at first it was, it was hard. It was hard. It was scary because we don't, you know, I don't have medical training. My husband doesn't have medical training and, it, you know, it's a, a lot to, to, to do the dialysis. It's a lot to do the YouTube feeds. It's a lot to have all these medications. And it was just very scary, very intimidating. But um, over time, we kind of, you know, got settled into the routines and, you know, we got to become, you know, the experts at, uh, you know, our son's conditions and all the things that go with him to where, you know, when we change nurses and we, we, we get nurses, you know, we, we actually train them. They don't have to, to send someone to train him. We're like, you know, the experts at him, you know, at the moment. So, I mean, you know, things definitely got better. We definitely got, got used to that. And um, this last month, no, not, not last month, in, in April, on April 9th, uh, JJ got um, a kidney transplant. We we were listed on um, the deceased donor list. And you know, on the 8th, they called us and they said, you know, there's a matching kidney. So we drove to San Antonio where you know, they do uh, kidney transplant because there's no kidney transplant here in Austin. And then the next day he got a kidney transplant. So this is something that, you know, when he was born, we just didn't know if he was gonna be able to, to reach that point, you know, because he had so many complications and there just wasn't a lot of, of, of people with, of babies with that condition that had survived. So, I mean, just, I could just, I cannot, you know, begin to just express like how grateful we are, you know, for the donor family and, you know, for the team in Cincinnati, for the team of doctors that we have here in Austin that helped us take care of JJ. But yeah, he got his kidney transplant. He stayed in the hospital for, for about three weeks. And then, you know, we stayed outpatient in San Antonio about another week. And, you know, now we are, we're back home. He is thriving. He's this, he just like already, he was in like this happy kid with a bunch of energy, but it's, is, is even happier. Like he plays with his brother. His skin looks good. He's gaining weight. He looks tall. I mean, it just, it's just an amazing transformation to watch. I mean, for me as a parent and I'm sure for, for the, um, the team of doctors that take care of him and he's doing so well. And we are, we are hopeful for what, you know, the future holds for him. I mean, there's definitely, you know, challenges that come with it. He's in physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. So, you know, he has a, a lot of things that, that happen with him, you know, lots of tight schedule compared to, you know, a child that is completely healthy, but uh, he's doing so well and we're so grateful. Wow, Daisy, that's, um, 
that's an incredible story and thank you for sharing that. Uh, and what a handsome young man. Um, I, I, can't, I can't help but as you were talking about that, think about you, you tell the story um, a little bit almost nonchalant, like this is just what we went through, this is what we had to do, but I cannot even imagine the emotional roller coaster that you and your family were on uh, to do everything that you could to save JJ. Um, and having the setbacks and all the challenges and the continued challenges and and what a uh, what a strong person that you are um, and what a, an amazingly strong uh, young man that JJ is um, to you know you can just see in his smile that how uh, wonderful life is for him despite those challenges um, that he's taking every moment of it and that you've enjoyed every moment of it even despite those challenges so. Uh, um, what would you, you know, quick question that I have before we continue on is the other families obviously un unfortunately get diagnosed with these conditions every day with different type of fetal anomalies um, that are going to go through similar situations. What advice do you have for them? Um, I would just say be your child's best advocate and, you know, just know that you know, all kids are, are unique and different. And, you know, just because they're not, you know, following someone else child's path doesn't mean that, you know, their life is still, is worthy, is complete, is, is full, even though they're different. So, you know, just, I mean, it's, it's easy, you know, as parents to try to want to compare with another child that's two and a half years old, compare with, you know, another child and say they're not meeting milestones. But I just know that, you know, kids are unique and, you know, take joy in, you know, the day-to-day -day victories that, you know, the kids have. And it's, it's hard, but um, I mean, it can totally be done. And, you know, our son has always, you know, brought us joy. We've always had, you know, so many doctors since before he was born. And like when we talk to like family or friends, you know, they think like, oh my God, they must be so overwhelmed. They must be, you know, so sad in, in the day-to-day -day lives. But actually, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, we, we're happy and he brings us so much joy and he's always brought us so much joy. So, I mean, despite the challenges, I mean, these kids are, are special and amazing and, and complete. That's incredible. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing uh, your story and JJ's story. I hope, uh, I know you'll probably keep it certainly in, in touch. I think even Talitha is getting teary-eyed over there uh, from the story uh, of everything that you've been through. And, and Talitha and I have um, uh, separately, but uh, both went through fetal anomalies with our own children and, and uh, can understand a, a bit of how when you get that diagnosis, all of a sudden everything flips and you become a parent that moment before they're born and do everything that you can to provide, to look for that hope and provide that hope. And you're gonna provide so many families hope today um, and in the future. So thank you for sharing that story. I know you'll keep in contact with the Cincinnati Fetal Care Center and the importance they have uh, to you and your family. I hope you let us know how JJ is doing as well uh, as he continues uh, to grow and, and become a even more beautiful young man and inspiration. So thank you for sharing that story. Uh, and then I think, uh, Mel, do you want to take over and for our next part? Sure, I think Dr. McKinley is up next. He is one of our maternal fetal medicine doctors from University of Cincinnati Medical Center. And he will be talking to the group today about prenatal diagnosis. And uh, we get to see some ultrasounds today. Yes, uh, thank you um, for having me. It's a privilege to be a part of this um, fetal health discussion today um, with my partners. And I really wanted to say thank you to Daisy. Uh, beautiful story. Um, it's great to hear on the other side um, how things go, some of the things we do prenatally. Um, a lot of courage to share that story on this event and uh, hopefully provide a lot of mothers that are going through similar diagnosis now or in the future with a lot of hope um, about what can happen in this, what is often a um, difficult diagnosis as you, as you described in a, long, in a long journey. And so um, also just wanna echo uh, sentiments from Lonnie that uh, JJ is a very, very uh, beautiful child. So uh, thank you for sharing those pictures. So with that said, I was gonna review a little bit of the prenatal diagnosis. Let me know if you cannot see my screen. 
So um, the way this is first found usually is via ultrasound. We have other types of fetal imaging techniques um, for babies and moms, but the, the standard for most women in a routine pregnancy is to get you know, a dating ultrasound around 13 weeks and then um, an anatomy scan usually around 18 to 20 weeks. Sometimes women get an ultrasound in between there and, and several after that, but oftentimes when we find this, this is around that, those first ultrasounds. Some of the classic findings that we would see on a prenatal ultrasound are shown here on the screen. The, the one on the left here um, is a picture of a baby on kind of a side view. The baby's head is up this way and the baby's bottom is this way on the right side of the screen. The amniotic fluid is black. So fluid on ultrasound is black. Bones are bright white, as you can see the skull here on the baby's head. And then tissues are various shades of gray. And what you can see on this picture on the right is you know the spine kind of coming down here with those little white dots and then you see this large black fluid balloon shaped structure in the belly uh, with this kind of out out pouching here and this is uh, the a very classic finding for bladder outlet obstruction so it shows this enlarged fluid filled structure in the pelvis which is generally the bladder the fluid around the baby starts to become low because after all the amniotic fluid is fetal urine and then what can happen is if the, if the, if the bladder is obstructed, then the, the place that makes the urine and sends it to the bladder, it starts backing up from that as well. And those structures are the ureters and the kidneys. And so when we look on the picture on the left, we can see a kidney here. And the, the kidneys, uh, what we call calyces are dilated and full of fluid as well. And they're starting to impart uh, what we call severe hydronephrosis, which is just a fancy word for fluid kind of backing up in the kidneys. And then it's starting to cause some damage to the kidneys themselves, which is you know uh, not what we wanna see, but it's often what we see. So when they get to us, we do repeat an ultrasound as well. Um, and we also, but we, we know that there's associated anomalies in babies that have bladder outlet obstruction, uh, oftentimes cardiac problems. So we get a fetal echocardiogram but also to get a really good view um, of the baby's belly, brain, and structures we can't see well with echo or ultrasound, we get a prenatal MRI as well. As you can see here from these just pictures, um, the you know, image resolution on prenatal MRI is, is very nice and it really helps to, to kind of show what's going on very well. The picture on the left is just a MRI from a healthy fetus without any problems. And you can see that the nice profile here, baby's head, uh, baby's spine here, bottom, and amniotic fluid on MRI contrast to ultrasound is white. And so you can see there's lots of amniotic fluid. Um, there's some fluid around the brain, which there should be. And this baby looks very healthy. And a baby that has bladder outlet obstruction, uh, the picture on the right depicts um, a, very different, a very different view. So we have this same kind of distended bladder, which is this structure right here that's full of white fluid that's enlarged. And you can actually see that the bladder wall itself is uh, thickened here. Um, and that's due to the stress on the, the bladder wall. And it, it's just a muscle, so it gets thick when it's under tension for a long period of time. But the most profound thing is the lack of am amniotic fluid or white around the baby. You can see the baby's kind of pressed up against the placenta and just very squeezed inside the uterus. And that's, um, you know, one of the things that we uh, commonly see, and it's the biggest problem um, with bladder outlet obstruction that we'll talk about in a moment. So these are some selected images from MRI of some of the things that we classically see. The picture on the left demonstrates the enlarged bladder, this large fluid filled structure in the pelvis, kind of pressing up all the other organs in the belly are compressed up towards the diaphragm. The fluid again is low. There's no whiteness, white fluid around the baby, right up against the placenta. The fluid then can back up into the kidneys and cause damage to the kidneys. Some of the common things that we see are these, what we call cystic dysplastic changes. And so here's a picture of one kidney here with this large multiple cyst that have replaced normal healthy tissue. This view here is from the side, looking at one kidney specifically. This view right here is from the front looking specifically at both kidneys, and you can see that they're both uh, cystic and abnormal. I like to use the analogy of this uh, 
bathtub when I'm talking to patients about amniotic fluid. Uh, I think it's a tangible um, analogy that's helpful to understand what's going on. So essentially the amniotic fluid is similar to a bathtub where the faucet coming in is the baby peeing and then the drain going out is the baby swallowing. And so if you have a steady state of water dripping in and the drain going out at about the same rate, you should have a nice even uh, level of fluid in the bathtub. But if you start to have a problem where the faucet's not turned on, but it continues to drain, i.e. the baby continues to swallow, then what will happen is that the fluid will eventually drain out of the tub, as we all know when we finish our baths. So this is essentially what happens. The baby's able to still swallow properly, but because of the bladder outlet, the fluid in the tub uh, is no longer able to get from the bladder out to around the baby, which results in low fluid or what we call oligohydramnios. So why do we care? Uh, well, we care for several reasons. Um, one, just knowing about what's going on with the bladder and kidneys is helpful to talk to the patients about what to expect after birth from a renal and bladder standpoint. Um, they meet with our nephrology and our urology colleagues to kind of talk about management options for those specific conditions. <clears throat> but prenatally, what I'm primarily focused on is what is the effect of the fluid on the rest of the baby, particularly on the lungs. So we know that the baby frees this fluid into the lungs as well as acts as a buffer to prevent mechanical compression of the uterus on the fetal chest. And this, if there is no fluid, will result in the lungs not properly developing. The lack of blood flow to the lungs as well as the blood, the lungs not able to expand will result in something called pulmonary hypoplasia that are lungs that don't function well after birth. So the result of kind of all of these changes that we typically see when um, a, a baby has severe bladder outlet obstruction are the um, distended bladder, as we discussed, the enlarged or cystic kidneys, uh, low fluid around the baby, and the small or hypoplastic lungs. You can also see some mechanical compression effects from the uterus itself causing club feet or like a flat face. Um, and the tube that connects the kidneys down to the bladder is often dilated as well, which is this reference to hydronephrosis. So that's kind of the, the, the summary of findings that we would typically see. Now, obviously this is a condition that has um, different spectrum of presentation. So not all babies have all of these things. And sometimes some of these things are more severe than others, but this is the general uh, milieu of uh, findings that we would expect to see. So when we think about the bladder being distended in this kind of generic term bladder outlet obstruction, there's a variety of possible actual underlying uh, etiologies or causes. Those would include um, primarily posterior urethral valves, especially in a male baby. Um, you can have complete um, non-formation of the urethra, which is something called urethra atresia. And the urethra is just the, the small tube that connects the bladder out uh, through the genitalia into the amniotic fluid. You can have anterior urethral valves uh, and more complicated syndromes as well that we wanna make sure that, it's, that it is in fact um, not something like prune belly syndrome or cloacal malformations. I think I'll, I'll stop there and see if you have any questions about the diagnosis. And before I turn it over to my partner, Dr. Rymeski, about some of the interventions that we have to offer when we see this constellation of findings. Thank you, Dr. McKinney. I was going to say for questions, if uh, anyone is, is watching us live on Facebook, if you have questions, you can type them in there. And Talitha, our executive director of the Fetal Health Foundation, will be moderating that and popping those up on chat. Uh, for us to answer. Uh, I guess a, a question that I have, Dr. McKinney, is do we, you, you listed some of the various things that cause it, but do we know why those, those particular things happen? Do we have any reason or is it just kind of a development thing that happens during, as the baby's developing that doesn't fully happen or do we have any information? Um, we don't have a lot of information about why maybe a posterior urethral valve, you know, doesn't open up or something like that, but we but once we do see that and we do have that distended bladder, we have a fairly good understanding of 
why the lungs don't develop. The bladder itself is very large, and so it compresses up on the diaphragm, which squishes the lungs from the, the inferior aspect. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, the lack of fluid around the baby squeezes on the chest and, you know, doesn't allow the lungs to expand normally. And this um, compromises the vascular flow to the lungs and, you know, bringing all the nutrients and oxygen to help them develop, but also it, it prevents the baby from, you know, swallowing and, and, and taking in some of that fluid that we think is important for pulmonary development as well. So, um, so when, when you have a condition like this, you kind of get hit all three ways for the lungs with the compression uh, from low amniotic fluid, the uh, bladder pushing up against the lungs, and then the baby unable to press, swallow the amniotic fluid to help with lung development. That's right. Wow. Um, can you, uh, I, with, uh, with the um, amount of, um, uh, or I was going to say with, with some of the bladder outlet obstruction things I've heard, uh, you mentioned prune belly. Can you explain a little bit about what that is? Cause I don't, I think I'm under misunderstanding if prune belly is you kind of mentioned it could be a cause of outlet obstruction or is it a, is it a result of outlet obstruction? Sure. Uh, prune belly is <clears throat> a little bit difficult sometimes to tell prenatally if that's what's present. Um, but typically with prune belly, the bladder is, um, much, much more dilated than we see in classic bladder outlet obstruction. And we see also abdominal wall laxity. And um, those are some of those, some of the features that we more typically see with prune belly rather than an actual problem with the blockage of the urethra. Rather, it's a laxity on the abdominal wall and the bladder that doesn't squeeze out the fluid as well as being obstructed per se. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinney. I think we are going to uh, Dr. Rameski next uh, to talk about some of the interventions. Okay, hopefully everyone can see those slides. So I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the interventions that uh, can be offered. And of course, all of these things are completely dependent on the individual patient and scenario. Um, I also want to echo my thanks to Daisy for sharing her story. Uh, it's incredible to see JJ. I remember him as a tiny little baby in the NICU, and it's wonderful to, to see him all grown up and, and doing so well. So Daisy, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, Daisy even mentioned the first thing, so that's a good segue. So uh, oftentimes, you know, once you've seen a high-risk pregnancy doctor, maternal fetal medicine like Dr. McKinney, oftentimes the first thing that is suggested or recommended is called a bladder tap. And that's basically a procedure where in the office, um, the maternal fetal medicine physician would uh, go through mom's uh, belly and place a needle into the bladder to withdraw the fluid. Uh, some people test the fluid to look at different electrolytes. There's not necessarily a lot of, uh, of uh, consensus around whether or not that's helpful, but what is helpful from the bladder tap is to see if the bladder refills. Because unfortunately, by the time that this is diagnosed, even if it's diagnosed early in Daisy's case at you know the 20 week ultrasound, sometimes the kidneys have already stopped working. Um, so depending on whether or not the kidneys are still making urine is gonna depend on what is the best uh, solution moving forward? What treatments might work for you and your baby versus aren't gonna be successful? So the first two procedures that I'm gonna mention depend on the kidneys still making fluid. So neither one of these interventions, the shunt or the, the fetal cystoscopy will really help you if the, if the fetal kidneys aren't making urine. So the first thing is called a bladder shunt or a vesicoamniotic shunt. So this is basically taking a tube and I'll, sh I'll show you on the next slide here and then come back. Uh, so these are both shunts. So these are flexible tubes that are placed through the mom's abdominal wall into baby's bladder with one end of the shunt in baby's bladder and one end of the shunt outside of the baby's abdominal wall in the amniotic space. So if the urine is blocked from exiting through something like a posterior urethral valve or urethral atresia or whatever the reason is that the bladder can't drain, this tube will allow the urine that's being produced by the kidneys to drain out into the amniotic space and repopulate the amniotic fluid. Um, shunts can work great. 
but they are, you know, little tubes that are on the on the fetal abdominal wall. And if you've ever watched an ultrasound of a fetus, you know that they're moving around a lot. Their arms and legs are moving around. So it is very common that the fetus will actually pull these shunts out. So when you look at moms who have had uh, vesicoamniotic shunting, uh, the average number of shunts placed during the pregnancy is around two and a half. So it's not uncommon that you might have to have the procedure done a second time if the shunt gets disrupted. And the decision around that would of course be dependent on you know, where you are in the pregnancy and all of that. So that's what a bladder shunt is or vesicoamniotic shunt. Um, the other option which can work in certain situations uh, is fetal cystoscopy. So this is basically where we can actually, because the bladder is so big, if, you're, if you kind of keep in your mind that picture that Dr. McKinney showed of that gigantic bladder that was all filled with urine, you can imagine that gives us a pretty big target to aim for. So we can actually do a surgery um, where we go in through a mom's abdominal wall. So we make a small incision and we use ultrasound and then we place a small camera into the, amniotic, into the amniotic space through the baby's bladder and into the bladder. And then we're kind of in this bladder, this big space that's full of fluid. And we can try to find these posterior urethral valves or whatever is preventing urine from going out. And at that point, we can do a number of things. Um, sometimes we, we can actually see the valve and we can take a small laser fiber and sort of burn and disrupt that valve to allow fluid to come out. Other times we can actually pass a catheter from inside the baby's bladder to outside of the baby to kind of create almost like another shunt. Or if you've ever heard of like a Foley catheter that's put in you know, to drain urine from your bladder, it's basically like a reverse Foley catheter where we're putting it in from the inside and then pushing it towards the outside to allow fluid to make it outside of the bladder, repopulate fluid around the baby and allow for lung development. So those first two options, the shunting, and the, and the fetal cystoscopy are both reliant on the kidneys working. But if you come and your kidneys and the baby's kidneys are not working at that point, that's where other interventions can come into place like the amnio infusions. And as Daisy was mentioning, uh, and Mel counted up all of her procedures, she had 11 amnio infusions during, during the pregnancy. The amnio infusions can be two, done in two ways. The most common way that we, that we do in a lot of centers around the country is by direct approach, where you go into the office, as she said, weekly, then twice a week, and then three times a week, uh, where a needle is placed into that amniotic space and fluid is run in to simulate um, fluid around the baby so the baby can swallow and help with lung development. Uh, there is a different technique that we use in some moms where if you're familiar with like what a metaport or a, a port is that some people will have placed when if they're having chemotherapy, we can actually take that same port device and rather than put the end of the catheter in a blood vessel to give medications into the bloodstream, we can put the end of that port into the amniotic space and then bring the port out onto mom's lower sort of rib cage. And then rather than having the needle you know, placed multiple times, the port can just be accessed to run the fluid in. Mom has to have a surgery to have that done. Um, sometimes the catheter can get dislodged and there are other things that have to happen with that. And then of course, at the end of the pregnancy when baby is being delivered, we have to take the port out. So uh, that is an option for some moms and direct approach versus the port. So I think when we're thinking about fetal interventions, those are the kind of things we have in our mind during the evaluation. And really what the, the best option is depends totally on the patient, the family, you know, the current medical situation and, and what they wanna do. Because what none of these procedures will do is make the kidneys normal. You know, whatever the kidneys are, the kidneys are. Sometimes they're irreversibly damaged by the time the diagnosis is made. Other times they can continue to function. But these interventions are all aimed at putting fluid back around the baby to help with uh, lung development and try to create a baby that when they're born can breathe and survive. Here's a picture of how the shunt is done. So you can see the introducer is placed. And then on that picture on the left, you can see with half the shunt in the bladder and half the shunt in the amniotic space um, and an ultrasound picture showing the same. So the big dilated bladder and then the lower picture with the two arrows, this is the shunt in the decompressed bladder. Uh, this is a picture of serial amnio infusion. So using ultrasound, 
uh, in the office, uh, a needle is placed and fluid is placed around the baby to repopulate the fluid. That makes it sound really easy. It's not easy. Dr. McKinney can speak to that. And as, as Daisy mentioned, it's not always the most comfortable thing, but uh, it's something that is, is possible if that's what you're looking for. So I think that's it for the interventions. I'm happy to answer any questions before we move on to Dr. Riddle's part about taking care of these babies in the NICU. Yeah, I have a question um, for you. We, we, obviously, there's a lot of different kind of variations of, of potential treatments that can be done. Um, what designates what type of things that you'll try? Some of it depends on the mom, obviously. You know, none of these things are required, and and some people are are not, you know, interested in in these kind of interventions. Um, a lot of it, like I mentioned, the the you know the first two are really only options if the kidneys are still working. So if the kidneys aren't working, really the only intervention on the table would be the amnio infusion, either by direct approach or the port to repopulate the fluid. So a lot of it really depends on that evaluation. Um, and, and mom's health, of course, is first. So there are some moms that might not be candidates for some of these surgeries because their health is not good enough to undergo an operation. And that's something that we discuss as a group. So I don't think that there's like one particular um, option that's the best for everyone. Uh, and there's no, you know, these are highly complex and, and, and different scenarios. You know, we'll see combinations of, of bladder outlet obstruction with multi-cystic kidneys. We'll see, you know, normal bladder and, and abnormal kidneys. And there's so many different variations. And, you know, sometimes this is picked up very early in the pregnancy, other times much later. So the gestational age of the pregnancy may affect what would be offered. Uh, because at a certain point it, in lung development, it doesn't make that much sense to try to get fluid back around because the lungs have already kind of done what they're going to do. Uh, so late in pregnancy, we wouldn't offer these things. Uh, but I think the most important thing is if you're in this situation uh, to reach out, speak to your doctors. Um, and, you know, obviously, if they aren't able to provide these things and you're interested, you know, reach out to centers like ours, the Fetal Health Foundation that has lots of information about these conditions uh, and find the right place for you and your family. I think uh, two, two quick additional, well, maybe not quick questions, but um, questions that come to mind is, is um, number one, you know, uh, when Dr. McKinney showed the picture of the bladder, that is just unbelievable. I know it's something you see, but when for a lay person seeing that it's ginormous, does that, I mean, we know it obviously causes damage to the kidneys uh, because they're not able to function properly, but does that cause issues with the bladder itself being dissented that much? So these children can definitely have long-term bladder issues. And that's why after babies are born, it's really important for the urologists and nephrologists and everyone to be involved with management of that bladder. Because as he also showed in the picture, that bladder is really thick. You know, so a thick bladder doesn't necessarily contract and empty um, the way that you would typically expect. So you know, it's very common for catheters to need to be placed after the babies are born. And once those catheters are removed, oftentimes parents need to learn, if the baby is producing urine, parents often need to learn how to do what we call intermittent catheterization, where, you know, they actually pass a catheter into the bladder multiple times per day to make sure the bladder is emptying to keep the bladder and the kidneys healthy. Yeah. And uh, another thing that I kind of thought of, and, and this is uh, help with understanding, because if I have this question, I'm sure others do too. You talked about that sometimes the treatment will depend whether the kidneys are working or not. And I'm, I'm curious if the kidneys aren't working. So if I'm thinking about how <laughs> the kidneys are, are creating the urine, letting out into the, the bladder, where if the kidneys aren't functioning, then what happens to the fluid? Do they somehow bypass the kidneys and they're just not filtering or what happens to that? You mean in, in utero, what happens utero, to the yeah. fluid? Yeah, so if the kidneys aren't working with the babies taking in fluid and the kidneys aren't working, where does it go? So we'll see fluid back up into the kidneys. When I say the kidneys aren't working, I mean, they're not filtering and doing the things that they need to do. So some of the fluid is probably absorbed through the GI tract, you know, so as it's passing through the intestines, it gets absorbed. Some of it's actually absorbed in the lungs and some of it will actually just back up in the kidneys, but the kidneys are not, sort of pushing urine forward, producing urine, filtering urine, doing all of those things. So that would affect, you know, obviously what the expectations would be after baby is born, which I think Dr. Riddle is gonna get into that. 
great segue. <laughs> yeah, All thank right. you so much, Lonnie. I'm gonna share these slides and pick up there. Um, and just as Dr. Imeski said that there's no one exact pathway for moms in this situation, there's also no one exact pathway for babies that have a diagnosis of bladder outlet obstruction. Um, and so I'm going to talk about sort of the spectrum of possibilities. Um, and as we've sort of highlighted multiple times along the way, well, I care very much about kidneys and I care very much about bladders and all of these things. Really the first thing any newborn does when they are, uh, when they are born is they come out and they cry and they take a big deep breath. And if the lung tissue hasn't developed normally, that very simple first step may not happen normally. And so unfortunately for babies that have low fluid around them, um, ar around that critical time of lung development. So that sort of 16 to 26 weeks is what we call the most critical period of lung development. When the fluid is low or absent during that time, the lungs have not fully developed and the blood vessels growing to those lungs have not fully developed. And so we see that many babies in this situation will require some amount of breathing support. For babies who've had some fluid um, that we've been able to keep up either artificially or naturally through the pregnancy, um, those babies will not have quite as high of needs for breathing support, but it's still fairly common to need at least some amount of oxygen or breathing support for at least a few days or sometimes even a few weeks after they're born. The ones we worry about the most though are the ones who've had sort of long standing low or absent amniotic fluid. Um, and unfortunately babies in these situations have a very, very high chance of mortality. And unfortunately that number, even if we do everything we can for the newborn after delivery, that chance of survival is still sort of on the 50-50 range. Um, depending on where you are, depending on what kind of care um, is provided to the newborn. But we know about 90% of babies in this situation who've had low fluid for a period of time will need the help of a breathing machine or a ventilator. Um, and unfortunately, many babies will be on the ventilator for a period of time, not hours or days, but sometimes even weeks. An additional problem that we see is the blood vessels growing to the lungs. Anytime the lungs are small, the blood vessels that take blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen and take out to the body can also be small and underdeveloped. And so then that taxes the heart. That makes the heart have to work very hard to pick up oxygen to take to the rest of the body. And so something called pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure to the lungs can happen, which only makes the baby system have to work harder. There are a lot of medications that we can give to help with this. There are things that we can do with the ventilator to help with this. But unfortunately, those two things together are what make it challenging for the babies in the first days after they're born. We know the kidneys will need help too. Um, and so knowing whether the baby was able to make fluid through the rest of the pregnancy is very important. So there's sort of two big groups that babies will fall into. Those who are still able to make some amount of urine, sometimes that's a little, but not quite enough. Sometimes that's actually way too much. Sometimes the kidneys get damaged and they lose the ability to concentrate the urine. And so they're just losing water like crazy. For those babies, there are a lot of things that we can do with their IV fluids, with their feedings, with medications, that we can try to help their kidney function over time. And they don't need the help of basically replacing the kidney function. The other bucket of babies is those who don't make any urine at all. We call them um, aneuric. That means that they don't make any urine. And mom has done the job of filtering baby's blood while they're in the womb. With the placenta, mom is doing all of that. But once baby is born, their kidneys should take over and start filtering all the toxins and fluids out of their body into the urine. When that doesn't happen, that means we have to take over and do that for them. Um, and I will talk about that in a little bit, um, but that is usually in the form of dialysis as Daisy told us about happened with JJ. One thing that's very important for babies who are 
sick with any diagnosis after they're born, if it's a birth defect or if they have an infection, no matter what the, the cause is uh, of their illness, we know that they need um, lots of calories for growth. And many moms in this situation are wondering, this is out of my control. Many of these things are not things that I can influence in any way, but that's not actually true. We know that for these babies, breast milk is like a medicine, especially for those whose kidneys are not functioning well. Breast milk is one of the most simple things for them to digest and to process. And so breast milk is absolutely the best thing that they can have. And so moms in this situation are absolutely encouraged to pump and to provide breast milk, whether it's through a bottle or whether it's through a feeding tube, um, it is like a medicine for these babies. But we know that their systems are growing at baseline, but they're also healing. Some of them will need a surgery in the first days or weeks after they're born. And so they need lots of calories to grow and to heal themselves. So it's very common for us to need to add things like protein, um, like extra calories, um, but they often will also need the help of a feeding tube just to make sure that they can get all of that in um, to help them recover. When we talk about the bladder um, and other surgeries that they might need, you were very correct in noticing that when the bladder has been that big and that distended for often weeks or months, um, it can have long-term effects on how it works after baby is born. So typically the first thing that we will do to try to help the bladder and kidneys is as simple as putting in a bladder catheter. So from the outside in um, to drain all the urine that has accumulated, both to relieve any pressure that it's putting on the lungs by pushing up, but also just to try to relieve some of that back pressure that can happen to the kidneys. Um, that bladder catheter will stay in for a period of time. And oftentimes that's many days, sometimes weeks, until the baby from a breathing and heart perspective is ready to have that obstruction repaired. And that's when the urologist will take the baby to the operating room and hopefully fix that obstruction. But as Dr. Rymeski mentioned, many babies, even after we fix that obstruction um, or the blockage, they will still need long-term care to help the bladder stay healthy. For many, that's putting a bladder catheter in intermittently through the day, three or four times a day sometimes. For other babies, that's medications that helps the bladder squeeze and to help it empty periodically. Um, and there are a number of other possibilities that can happen. The long-term worry that we always have is whether the kidneys have been damaged enough before birth to function on their own and to do that filtering of the blood. And for some babies, that answer is no. Um, and so as you heard from Daisy here at our center and in a, a few centers across the country, we have the ability to do dialysis of the blood for newborns. Um, and it's not something that is easy or um, without issue, but it is something that we're very, very excited about having the ability to do here. So what you see in front of you are two kinds of dialysis that we can do um, for newborns. The one on the left is something that we sort of colloquially call Aquadex. It's called aquapheresis. This is a machine that was not designed for a baby though. This is a machine that was designed for an adult um, that we have modified to use for a newborn. And so it's something that they will have several hours during the day where this machine will filter the toxins and fluid out of their blood, do the job of the kidneys. The machine on the right is something that we're very excited about here at Cincinnati Children's. This is a machine called Carpe Diem. So this is the first uh, newborn directed, so infant and newborn directed form of continuous dialysis. Um, it is very sensitive. So it has the ability to do dialysis for babies even as small as five pounds. Um, and it is something that we are the first FDA approved site um, to use this kind of machine here in the United States. Um, so it is something that is very exciting for us um, in the NICU here. These machines aren't perfect though. And these aren't something that you can do blood dialysis for a long time in a newborn. These are sort of a bridge. Um, we usually 
our typical pattern is to use these machines for two or three weeks after a baby is born until we're able to transition to a type of dialysis that babies go home with. So the normal way that we do dialysis for a baby or an infant and even a child is to use something called peritoneal dialysis. And that's what, what uh, Daisy was telling us that JJ ultimately went home with. Um, and this is where we use the baby's belly. Um, so we all have in our abdomen, the lining of all of our intestines and internal organs have something called the peritoneum and it acts like a filter. So if you put clean uh, fluid in, it will filter out some of the toxins and fluid and we can drain those toxins back out of the body. And so it is sort of the, the way that babies will go home long-term um, as they are awaiting ultimately a kidney transplant. Um, as, J, as Daisy told us for JJ, once you have made that jump to dialysis, Ultimately, that means the kidneys are not functioning um, and we ultimately are replacing that function until we can replace them. Um, and so kidney transplants are ultimately required for babies that need dialysis after they're born, but that's not done immediately. They're too small, they're too fragile. And so it's usually around two or three years of life when they're at least 20 pounds um, that they are evaluated and undergo that kidney transplant. This can be a long road. So as you heard from Daisy, babies are not in the NICU days or weeks, but often months, especially if they need dialysis after they're born. But even if they don't need dialysis, as we're sort of helping their, their bladder function, as we're helping their breathing, as we're helping them eat, um, it's often uh, that they're in the NICU with us for, for weeks. Um, and so it's important that we have a good relationship with family because we know so many of our families come from all over the country um, that we know this is a big upheaval for their life. And so we work very closely with the Ronald McDonald House, um, but also doctors back home. So many of our babies are actually able to go like JJ did back to a hospital close to home so that they continue their care with their family in a place that's close to them. I'd like to thank Daisy as well as everyone else has. We, I also remember JJ in some of his more tenuous days and uh, it's awesome to see how far he's come. And I'm so happy to hear that he finally got his kidney transplant. Makes what we do very worthwhile. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you guys. You wouldn't have you know, made it this far without you. I mean, for the rest of my life, for the rest of JJ's life, we are so indebted to the entire team at Cincinnati Children. That uh, was uh, incredibly enlightening uh, and just amazing to, you know, I, I, I think as Fetal Health Foundation, so I have to probably concur with this, we, we've come across bladder outlet obstruction issues. We, we have very limited involvement when we're working with a family, um, but to the degree of this almost being you have with bladder outlet obstruction, you, you have the, the main issue, but the myriad of additional issues that it ends up causing is just mind blowing and boggling. And uh, I commend uh, your center for the amount of work um, and care that you take in this because really it is a multidisciplinary amount of work that needs to be done to care for these babies. and. And Daisy, wow, you know, JJ is is definitely a true, true miracle and hero and what a strong little man uh, for sure. Um, we are getting kind of close to wrapping up. I want to be sensitive to everyone's time. Uh, is there anything that uh, we didn't really cover that anybody else wants to share? They're all silent. You did a fantastic job. <laughs> you know, I would... Uh, let me last on, on a more personal level for, for each of, uh, for Dr. McKinney, Meski, and, and Dr. Riddle, um, and even uh, Mal, um, this, is, this is a lot of work that you guys put into. What, what drives you to do this? Obviously, I know there's the, the, you know, the uniqueness of the medicine side of it, but personally, what drives you um, when you have a situation like this or any type of fetal anomaly? I think in this particular set of diagnoses for me, you know, when I was in my fellowship was when we had first started doing 
dialysis on these babies and just started trying to see, can we make these babies survive? And, and, and Mel was there with us. She, she knows this. Dr. Riddle was also doing her training at that time. Like we weren't very successful. And, and so with every baby, we learned more and more and more about the things that it takes to actually get these babies home from the NICU and to have these families like willing to go through this knowing that like maybe their baby wasn't gonna survive, but a baby in the future might, I think was like really moving and inspired me to continue to do this. Absolutely. And like you said, Lonnie, the, the complications and the mortality and things, there are things we can do to make this better. And it's things that we're learning all the time, um, but there's new technology down the road. There's always new things to learn. And I think that when you're looking at a diagnosis where there is you know, a high downside at times, it is something where you can see that you've made a difference for some patients. Yeah, I would, I would just add, you know, we do a lot of evaluations from people all over, you know, all over the region, all over the country. And, you know, not all of them choose to go forward with a lot of interventions. And, and that's, we, we, we applaud that as well, as long as they feel like that's the loving decision for their family. You know, I think, so I think coming to our fetal center or any fetal center that does similar type things is really helpful to just hear the subspecialty counseling. So you know, when they come to our center, we, we do all this imaging and then we sit down in a team meeting setting with uh, similar to what we did today with our nurse coordinators, with our pediatric surgeons, MFM, NICU, uh, nephrology, urology, and even transplant surgery sometimes and uh, talk about what exactly is going on, what exactly are the options, what are the risks of these options, which we didn't get into today. Um, and, you know, what are the outcomes if we do provide these types of interventions versus if we don't? And allowing the, empowering the families to have that information to make the right decision for their family is, is why I do it. So, you know, if, if the family feels that this isn't what they had bargained for and when they got pregnant, then we respect those views and we do everything we can to make the pregnancy they, what they want it to be. If it, it's some of these things that we can try are things they want to try, then we want to walk that journey with them as well. And, um, you know, just make them feel loved and make them feel heard and make sure that what's happening with their child, their fetus and themselves is, is what they want to happen. And so, you know, having and working in a center like Cincinnati Children's Fetal Center, uh, we have the ability to, you know, do that multidisciplinary counseling and get the information that they need to them. And it's just, uh, it is truly a dream job for most of all of us, I believe, and um, to be able to help these patients in, in this kind of way that in other other centers can't do the same, which um, is, is, is nice. It's a great, it's, it's a great feeling for us. And, and to see, you know, things like Daisy and JJ on the other end just makes us want to come back today and tomorrow. So. Yeah, thank you. That's um, you, what, what you uh, indicated there is, is so important. Dr. McKinney is uh, something that fetal health has always been big about is, is just educating families and getting them to the resources to educate them to make the best decisions that's right for their family. We always say our, our biggest, if we could say what our biggest goal as a foundation is, is that we never want anyone to come back and say, had I only known, or if I'd only known. We wanna eliminate those ifs um, so that they're fully aware of everything uh, that's going on. And the other thing I think that you said so well too, uh, all of you is your care and, and, and the love that you actually share with these families. I, it can be extremely intimidating um, and I'm sure Daisy can, can attest to this. And as we all know, as you, you, you get the diagnosis, it's a very scary situation. You might be with a, a perinatologist when you get the diagnosis or an MFM or sometimes just the obstruction, obstruction itself. Um, and then you then um, uh, feel like you go up into uh, a MFM where you see a perinatologist and, and sometimes uh, it the, it feels a little bit colder, a little less caring, a little bit more intimidating. Uh, and then all of a sudden now you're going to these amazing specialists, um, but you're kind of going up in the, um, the, the, the line of assistance and specialty, and it can be really intimidating. And what I've always found is, I think so many people don't realize is that when you get there, you get this amazing circle of care and compassion and love that, you know, you're, you're, you, what you guys put in your, um, 
uh, your blood, sweat, and tears in this isn't just about the, the clinical side of it. It's really trying to give those families the hope of, of saving their, their child or doing what's best in the best interest for their child or children, as the case may be, uh, being unborn at the time. And uh, I know that uh, I'm sure that you guys have had a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of worrying that you do just as much as the parents. So from that, from the Fetal Health Foundation, we thank you for everything that you do. Thank you again very much to our esteemed uh, panels and, and especially thank you to Daisy for sharing uh, your story and JJ's story. And I hope that you keep us updated uh, throughout the uh, JJ, JJ's development and how he's doing. We'd love to, to hear about how he's doing um, as time goes on. And, and uh, thank you very much to Cincinnati Children's Fetal Care Center for being wonderful steward partners with the Fetal Health Foundation and doing this fetal care chat today. Again, my name is Lonnie Summers uh, and we uh, thank you so much and have a pleasant day. Thank you.